Billy Bunter and the Midnight Feast, an awful yarn for sensible chaps, written by Richard Franks. Bunter, desist in this unconscionable turpitude. Mr. Quelch's gimlet eyes glinted with displeasure as they surveyed the corpulent figure labouring at the rear of the procession of Greyfriars' pupils. Yes, do get a move on, old man, called Bob Cherry, cheerily. Shake your leg, you fat cormorant, jeered Johnny Bull, bullishly. Shift your fat backside, lardy boy, said a person not in the story. Bunter puffed and panted as he tried to keep up, but it was hard going. His short fat legs were not made for rapid locomotion, especially when the gradient was so markedly against them. It really was beastly unfair, thought Bunter, too winded even to complain aloud. Why did they have to waste their time visiting putrid old castles, when there was probably a perfectly decent cake shop in the village? By the time Bunter had reached the flight of beastly steep stairs that led to the main door, the rest of the party had already gone in. Well, they can jolly well go, thought Bunter. I'll sit here and have a rest, get my second wind, and watch the sunset. He placed his rump on the cold stone of the bottom step, and took off his glasses to wipe them, with a handkerchief that appeared to be a hostel for vagrant gobstoppers. Somewhere in the forest that surrounded the low eminence on which the castle stood, a wolf howled. Bunter made it up the steps and inside at a pace Jesse Owens would have been proud of. He entered just in time to hear the beginning of what seemed like a lot of beastly rot, being spouted by a decrepit old buffer whom he assumed, rightly as it happened, was their guide to the ancient fortress. Between spasms of wheezing, coughing and drooling, old Theodore told them in broken to shattered English the long, involved and quite staggeringly tedious history of Castle Crass. The mighty Crupathian fortress had, it seemed, once been the seats of the Archdukes of Swarfiga, then of the terribly Archdukes of Chintz, before being briefly occupied by the outrageously camp Duke of Borussia Alton Yokebuk. And after that, the old man paused. The visitors waited patiently. The visitors waited impatiently. Eventually the pause became artistically unjustifiable, even within the comparatively roomy confines of the spoof gothic boy's own story subgenre. And then, grated Mr. Quelch querulously, then they come to this land, the bad times. Ah, the war, said Harry Wharton. Dastardly hun, agreed Frank Nugent. Fearful bosh, chimed in Lord Marlborough. The most dastardly militarist expansionist policy pursued by the post-Bismarckian empire of the naughty and large-moustached Kaiser Bill, concurred Harry Jamset Ram Singh. I say, was it the Germans? piped Bunter. But in response, old Theodore shook his grizzled head, sending cascades of grizzled dandruff down his grizzled velvet coat, only thirty kopecks in the gnarled retainer's R. Us end-of-year sale. Silently, he pointed to a painting that hung in a shadowed alcove. The Countess Caramella Erzatz Fangen, whispered Theodore, his voice hoarse with fear, his eyes rolling with horror, and his knees tremulous with loathing. He tottered a few paces, then raised his lantern. Yes, he had a lantern, it just wasn't thought necessary to mention it before this point, to illuminate the picture. There was a collective gasp. They all stared open-mouthed, and then to a chap the pride of the remove lowered their eyes and began shuffling their feet, all except Bunter, who, being a terrible advertisement for the ophthalmological profession, peered at the portrait and squeaked, hopefully, I say, you fellows, is it a lemon meringue? I am thinking that the most delightful young lady will almost certainly have been tragically dying of the pneumonia, mumbled Harry Jamset Ram Singh into his shirt-front. It was a thought that had occurred to all the chums. The woman in the portrait was... She had... She looked... Well, she made a chap wish he wasn't quite so jolly decent and British, which was a ghastly notion, of course. Fortunately, depraved thoughts worthy of the lowest Lasker Stoker or other swarthy Levantine had little time to fester in the minds of the strangely confused boys. Mr. Quelch, his darkly saturnine features paling redly, stepped smartly in front of the canvas. I think we have heard quite enough of the castle's colourful history for now, he said. 
you will show us to our quarters, if you please. Of course, but you must remember, I do not spend the night here. I go home to my little garlic warehouse in the village. Chuckling hoarsely, muttering darkly, and patting the top of his head while simultaneously rubbing his tummy, old Theodore led the Grey Friars party up the main staircase. For a moment, Bunter paused before the portrait, his nose barely an inch from the dead centre of the canvas. Two lemon meringues? he wondered. Then, realising he was in danger of being left alone in the murk of the great hall, he began labouring up the staircase. Bunter awoke in the small hours, or thereabouts, surfacing blearily from a dream of unprecedented jam sponge. What had disturbed his slumbers, which were usually so profound, not to say miasmic? For a moment he was nonplussed. Then, as if it possessed a tiny mind of its own, which it very probably did, Bunter's nose twitched. Then it twitched again, more decisively. Could it be? Yes, it could. Something coming. Something good. The unmistakable smell of baking. A pastryish, treacly sort of smell it was, wafting from who knew where within the ancient fortress, through untold miles of corridors, under Bunter's door, and up the most carbohydrate-sensitive nose in the Anglo-Saxon world. He climbed out of bed, put on his spectacles, wrapped himself in his dressing-gown, and set off in quest of the source of the delicious odour. "'I say, you fellows,' hissed Bob Cherry, shaking awake, Harry Wharton, Frank Nugent, Johnny Bull, Lord Marlborough, and Harry Jamset, Ram Singh, to save us all a bit of time. "'Oomph! Get off! What is it?' they all said. "'I think our fat friend just left on a voyage of discovery.' Bob Cherry pointed to a yawning chasm in the great four-poster that Bunter had commandeered in the vast bedroom. The rest of the removed party rose from their less comfortable pallets on the floor, and, swiftly lighting candles, flaming torches, and a small Japanese lantern, set off in pursuit. It was easy enough to track Bunter, as they simply headed for the last crash of falling armour. Despite his somewhat haphazard and noisy progress, Thanks to his unerring nasal organ, Bunter had soon reached the threshold of the great kitchen of Castle Crass. Sure enough, the huge stone-walled chamber was filled with the devilishly tempting aroma of food. Sweet food, sticky food, fattening food, all the food a very greedy schoolboy indeed could hope to eat. It smelled like Tuck City, to coin a phrase. But where were all the eatables? Bunter padded into the room, spectacles flashing in the lights of a dozen or more candles that burned fitfully in numerous sconces. Not scones, sconces, he told his wayward subconscious. But what cruel trick was this? Peer as he might, he could not descry a single doughnut. Perhaps the feast was still in the baking. The happy thought sent him rolling towards the row of great ovens, each as tall as he. A pudgy hand grasped the nearest handle and pulled. With a remarkably loud creak, the great iron door swung open. For a moment, Bunter closed his eyes. The wave of warm, sweet air made him shiver with anticipation. Then he leaned forward and stared myopically into the gloom, trying to make out what treat was lurking within. Come to me, my sweet, my dainty, my little fondant fancy. The voice was as rich and liquid as caramel sauce, and every bit as irresistible to Bunter. A slender, long-taloned hand languidly beckoned him forward. He began to clamber inside. No, no! Some tiny fragment of intelligence, long neglected by its owner, and thus somewhat rusty and hoarse of voice, told Bunter that, for the first, and almost certainly the last time in his short, fat existence, he was about to have a meal's eye view of gluttony. He hesitated, knees a wobble, as ancestral fears of sharp clawed things that lurk in dark places vied for control of his being with mesmerically induced gastric surgings. How to escape this treacly temptress? What stratagem could he call upon from his deep reserves of cunning? I'm expecting a postal order from my Aunt Judy, squeaked Bunter. With a single, lithe movement, the sinuous creature that had lain in wait on the bottom shelf leapt onto the fat owl, wantonly knocking his spectacles askew. Feverishly warm fingers smeared something sticky over his face. 
a face now immersed in hot breath that was redolent of centuries-old Balkan preserves. "'You beast!' howled Bunter. He struggled vainly to prevent his assailant sinking improbably overdeveloped canines into the fold of flesh at his throat. He struggled for only a few moments, however, as an entirely characteristic feeling of witless apathy and sloth overcame his panic terror. He slid into a deep stupor, a final despairing howl on his lips. By the time the chums of the lower fourth arrived in some haste, all was silent again, except for what was it? As if, at a silent command, the plucky fellows stood and listened. Something dripping, slowly, said sharp-eared Bob Cherry. And it's in here, added Harry Wharton, striding without hesitation to an oven whose door he wrenched open with the sort of manly decisiveness only possible if all your forebears had married cousins. Sure enough, a crumpled form lay on the bottom shelf, whimpering faintly. A trickle of blood or was it strawberry jam, flowed thickly onto the stone flags of the kitchen. "'By George!' said Lord Marlborough, forgivably lapsing into strong language in the heat of the moment. Meanwhile, Harry Wharton and Frank Nugent had hauled the semi-comatose form out into the light. Then the chums stepped back in horror, as well they might, for while the immense checked trousers and voluminous blazer were indeed those of the William Bunter they knew, the body within those garments was another matter entirely. "'Who is responsible for these unauthorised nocturnal perambulations?' The voice of Mr. Quelch recalled the pals to themselves. "'It's Bunter, sir,' began Bob Cherry. "'He's been sleepwalking, you see, and now he's thin,' chorused the entire company, including Mr. Quelch, who now stood over the recumbent form. It was indeed the case. It seemed that Bunter had been totally deprived of every trace of tubbiness, every peck of padding, every bit of bulk. Now the slim owl stirred and opened his eyes. I say, you fellows, I've just had the most beastly nightmare. The next evening the Greyfriars party left, having obtained lodgings in the nearby village of Zentral Casting. It was a subdued group of chums indeed who boarded the charabang at the castle gates, apart from the newly reduced bunter, who protested volubly at having to hold up his trousers with a large safety pin that recalled the flamboyant inefficiency of the Habsburgs. None of them dared to look back at Castle Crass. None except Mr. Quelch, who surely let nothing ruffle his grim composure. Perhaps but later the chums would whisper of the way the master had turned to look back at the castle, only to quickly revert to his original posture and stare fixedly at the roadside trees. Was his normally cadaverous face a little more deathly pale than usual? Perhaps. But who could blame the best of men for blanching at such a sight? A corpulent, bat-winged figure, limbed by the last vestiges of sunset, bouncing and jouncing wildly as it struggled to achieve air-speed velocity along the parapet of the time-haunted castle, while all around the deep, wild woods echoed and re-echoed to the mournful cry. Yaroo!